Well, good morning. We're um, going through a series of uh, messages uh, at the moment on encounters with Jesus. And uh, we've, uh, we've looked um, at the, the last couple of ones where the storm encountered Jesus and the disciples on the boat. And he's greater than any storm in our lives. And uh, last week, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, I keep wanting to say Bendigo, but um, encountered, uh, encountered Jesus in the fiery furnace. He's greater than uh, any, anything anyone can uh, send our way. And uh, today we're looking at the story of the woman uh, in John 8, the woman accused of adultery and how she uh, meets Jesus. Uh, Beck did offer to uh, sing Pretty Woman as uh, the first song, but um, for those of you who are not Roy Orbison fans, uh, or you may be a bit young for that, but anyway, uh, I'm happy with the, with the songs we've done. Um, so uh, it, the scribes and Pharisees actually in this story had a pretty serious encounter with Jesus as well. So this morning you're getting uh, two encounters for the price of one. Um, you may have um, seen some uh, TV programs uh, on um, how people discover their family history, whether that's good or bad. And um, we've been away recently for a few weeks in Latvia, where my father came from, because uh, we've discovered I've got two sisters, 85 and 83, and uh, that I've never known about till recently, and uh, nephews and nieces and cousins. So I even had to learn a bit of Latvian to make a little speech to them. We visited the farm where my family, where my father grew up. But while we were travelling, I, um, uh, I, I took this uh, little book that I, I got. Um, here's my uh, Kurong sales pitch. But uh, it's, it's a Gospel of Luke. And on one side it's got the text and on the other side got blank pages that you can um, fill in uh, your notes as you read. And uh, so I sort of read the Gospel of Luke as almost like a novel. With, uh, and one of my early mentors in my Christian life um, said, it's, it's always helpful um, uh, when you read the Bible. There's no one absolute way of reading the Bible. It's just important that we do read the Bible. And, uh, and to actually, uh, he said to me, thoughts disentangle themselves as they pass out through the lips and down through the pencil tips. You, you may never have heard that one before, but what he was saying was uh, it's not just reread, but when we actually share it with someone else, when we write something out, it just helps us to uh, chew over what God is saying in his word. And uh, one of the things that helped me to see was the, uh, in the gospel was just the flow of the story and how one story introduces another uh, and, and Jesus would tell a parable because of what had happened here and, and that there was a real leading in. And so this morning we're going to read uh, John 8, but it is important for us to understand the context of that so that we understand something of the story. And, uh, and, and uh, if you go back to the start of John chapter 7, it, it says the Jews were trying to kill him. Sometimes we miss that as we sort of think of meek and mild Jesus coming and teaching on the side of the mountain and yet here the ministry had started. He was starting to point out a few things in people's lives. Their lives were getting uncomfortable and it says the Jews were trying to kill him and he says they hate me because I testify that their works are evil. And, uh, and, and didn't Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. You, why are you trying to kill me? And then as you go on into John 8, finally John 8 finishes with they picked up stones to stone Jesus. So our story talks about the possibility of stoning a, pers a woman accused of uh, adultery, but finishes up with wanting to stone Jesus. And it helps us then to see something of what's going on as we, as we read our uh, passage from uh, John chapter 8. So um, let's, let's, let's read uh, John, if you've got your in, a Bible there on your phone or a hard copy, uh, let's read John 8 
uh, verses 1 to 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And at dawn, he went to the temple again. And all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the centre. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. And when they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the centre. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. When I uh, first started work uh, as, as an architect, I was in a large studio, a big open studio. And uh, you may find this hard to believe, but that was before we even had computers on our desk. It was all, uh, you just draw with ink on tracing paper. And uh, every now and then you'd be drawing something and all of a sudden a paper jet would skid across your drawing board or a scrunched up bit of paper would hit you in the back of the head. And, um, uh, and, and you'd look up and everyone would be very seriously looking down at their uh, drawing boards. And uh, it was uh, my last day, or almost my last day in that job. And um, a, um, as I was drawing, a, a rubber, a pencil rubber, just bounced across my desk. And I had an idea it came from Barry over on the other side of the studio. So I picked it up off the floor and uh, threw it back at him. And I missed, unfortunately. But just as I threw it, around the corner came my boss. And um, in those days, um, you actually, sometimes you even called them sir. You know, it was Mr. Hall, Mr. McDonald. This was very serious. But I looked at him and he looked at me and then he laughed. And he he said to me, "Uh, Harold, uh, for four years I've been trying to catch you doing something wrong and I've finally caught you, but it's the last day. (laughs) So I can't do anything. And, but our story today involves someone who got caught, someone uh, who was accused of doing something wrong but actually got caught in the act. But this is far more serious. And uh, and yet, in another way, as uh, one preacher says, it's one of the most fascinating and beautiful stories in all the accounts of Jesus' ministry. And uh, I, I, I struggled with it in a sense as, uh, as we were looking at it. But firstly, let's uh, consider the woman. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the centre. Teacher, they said, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. This wasn't rumour or a gossip machine, but caught in the very act. And yet... Over the history of the church, uh, people have been worried that this story, uh, does that mean that Jesus was soft on sin? Because you get to the end of the story and he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and uh, sin no more. And uh, it sort of worried people. But I just, I think I want to try and help us to see how this story pans out and how the encounter with Jesus, what that meant to the woman, what it meant to Jesus. But we've got to actually think firstly about what is adultery and how serious this was. You know, adultery 
is a voluntary sexual relationship with someone who is not your spouse. And somehow our whole culture has lost the seriousness of, of this and the, the deep sadness that this causes and the mess that it creates in, in family lives. In Hebrews 13, it, it says marriage is to be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God would judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. And we can sometimes, our culture wants to give us just either it says, well, it doesn't really matter or, or else we become proud. You're a bit like the Pharisee standing there. You know, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers. And, and so sometimes even reading this story, we could think, oh, well, that could never happen to me. You know, I've been coming to City Light for six years and, uh, and I'm pretty right. But there's a danger. We were talking about this during the week. Uh, it's like uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 12. Whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. And God sees adultery as, as very serious and so it's not that in a sense that Jesus has gone soft on this woman. It still was very serious. And, and because marriage, in another way of looking at it, it's like a picture of, of God's relationship with us, where he is unstintingly faithful toward us and, uh, and gets very jealous when we go after other idols other gods with a godly jealousy and uh, the Old Testament talks about spiritual adultery you know in Ezekiel the, the, the detestable practices of people who, uh, who despite all that God had done you know when we first came to City Light uh, there was a marriage course with uh, Paul Tripp uh, he wasn't there personally it was just uh, online but he began the series with the verse Luke 6.45, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart, from what overflows from his heart. And um, I thought it was a bit of a strange verse to start a marriage course on, but where Paul Tripp was coming from was that we're very good at making excuses. And we can simply say, well, I committed adultery because I was tired, because uh, um, my spouse didn't understand me. Um, you know, we expect our partner to be perfect. I mean, my wife Ruth is perfect, but, um, <laughs> but we can expect our partner to be perfect. And we haven't looked in the mirror recently and seen how imperfect we are, how much we need the Lord. You know, my, my father and mother... I look back, I, I felt they had a very good marriage. But my father used to say to me every now and then, um, especially after I got married, um, marriage is hard work. And it wasn't because of my mother, because she was a beautiful woman, but what he meant was, unless you put in to a relationship, it's not going to work. And unless you do the hard work of, of, of that marriage relationship, there's going to be a lot of temptations toward adultery if you don't recognise that. And if we don't recognise, as it says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? it it's a bit like someone said to me recently, and they're going into such a messy situation. They said, oh, isn't it lovely the way God led me? And I wish they could take to heart that verse, the heart is more deceitful than anything else. And we can't, we just got to be so careful when people around us who love us and care for us are wanting to help us and we think, oh, it could never happen to me. And we've got to recognise the deceitfulness of our hearts. Back as, as a young Christian, someone shared with me the, uh, the Billy Graham rule which um, is sort of, uh, you may not have heard that, but he, 
in all his travelling, in ministry, he had this rule that he would not be with another woman who was not his wife alone, just the two of them. And I know that sometimes that can, we can take that to an extreme as though, you know, you wouldn't dive into the water to rescue a woman who was <laughs> dr drowning um, or, you know, leave someone in a dangerous place. Well, that's not at all what's intended. But the danger is when we go to the other extreme and say nothing could ever happen. And, and we've got to learn to be, to be wise because adultery as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, which is a passage that's really helped me, is um, we've got to learn to live not with lustful passions, to not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in any way, to steal something that doesn't belong to me. And recognise that adultery, it doesn't just sort of happen in one sense it begins in my heart um, you know Jesus says uh, if you've heard it was said do not commit adultery the seventh commandment but I tell you everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart now in one sense the stories about this woman who committed adultery and how she encountered Jesus but I wanted us to see something of how serious this sin of adultery is. What a mess it creates and why G Jesus was concerned and, and to see the serious situation uh, that she's in, that God created marriage as a beautiful thing, not as something to tie us down, but something to fulfil our lives. And then when we break that, we can't learn from culture that it doesn't mean anything. It, it is a very serious thing. And so, not so much to minimise the sin when Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That was not minimising the sin in any way. Uh, but it, it was helping to restore her to all that God intended in her life. So, that's the woman. She's like brutally brought out and placed in the centre. What, what a way to deal with someone. But let's look at the scribes and the Pharisees. They, they had an encounter with Jesus. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the centre. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. You, you can't help but feel it's a bit like, you know, a school kids tell on each other. You know, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? But they asked this to trap him. They caught the woman in the very act. You, you know, I mean, really, it sounds a bit suspicious. Are you wandering around at night looking into people's windows? You know, yes, they could quote the right verse, uh, you know, if uh, back in Leviticus 20, if a man commits adultery with a married woman... If he commits adultery with his neighbour's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Well, where is the man? You know, doesn't that say something about the heart of these scribes and Pharisees? It's sort of like a partial following of the law. You know, they come to Jesus and say, right, this is what the law says. Yeah, but you're not even following uh, the law. And, and instead of loving God, and wanting to help people, they asked this to trap him. It was actually Jesus they wanted to stone. And it, it does worry you when you start to see how religious people can use people. They were just using this woman, using her up. They didn't care about her at all. And uh, we're just wanting to use her up. And, and we have got to be so careful as a church it's on our heart as elders to help all of you to come to maturity in Christ, but we, we never want to use you up. It, it, it can happen. And, and it's not, in one sense, it's not to deny the seriousness of adultery. We, we've, we've looked at that. But in this case, if you can have 
one sin that's greater than another sin. In, all, in one sense, it all falls short of the glory of God. But here was a group of men using up a poor woman, not to restore her, but to get at Jesus. It's like Galatians 6. If, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves that you also won't be tempted. It's so easy to come with a judgmental attitude and, uh, and, and uh, sin does that in our lives. It, it makes us very quick to judge and without knowing the full story, the full circumstance. And, and here were these men delighting uh, that they'd caught someone, but really it was only to try and catch Jesus out. There was no heart for this woman to help her. And sin, as it says back in Genesis, sin is always crouching at the door, ready to use us in, in the wrong way. So how were they trying to catch Jesus out? Well, if Jesus said, well, don't stone her, well, then they could report Jesus to the religious authorities and say, here's a man who says he's come to fulfil the law and not do away with any part of the law, and yet he's saying, don't do the law. Don't do what the law uh, says. And, uh, and if he says, well, stoner, where's his compassion? Where's the great heart of, of Jesus? And, and he's saying, put someone to death, when at that time, the Israel was occupied by Rome. And while... Rome allowed a certain freedom amongst the Jewish people. Uh, remember how when they wanted to crucify, when they wanted to kill Jesus and get rid of him, they had to go to Pilate. And, uh, you know, Pilate uh, comes out and says, well, what charge do you bring against Jesus? And, uh, well, if this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't bring him to you. And uh, Pilate says, will you take him and, and judge him? And, uh, and they said, well, according to the Roman law, we can't put anyone to death. And so here's Jesus, they're trying to get him to say, well, put the woman to death. They then report him to the Roman authorities. And uh, Jesus had a few questions like that, which uh, it's all about trapping him. And sometimes, you know, in our own lives, we, we, we do, I've, you know, do crazy questions to Jesus instead of trusting him and believing that he's got the best worked out for us. And so they come to Jesus with this trying to trap him. And, uh, and Jesus says, there he is, teaching in the temple, and they burst in, and they put this woman in the centre, and they give him this double-pronged, malicious question. And what does Jesus do? he stoops down and starts to write in the ground. We'd, probably, we'd love to know what he did write, but, uh, but, but God doesn't tell us. You, you'll probably, you can find out um, in eternity. But um, they persisted in questioning him. And how it must have broken his heart to think here were people that had created to live in the image of God and they were asking this malicious question to him. You know, the question was so terrible. He sees through it. It's, it's almost as though he doesn't hear. How could you ask God such a question? You know, he wrote the law. He lived the law as God intended it to be lived. But then in his amazing wisdom, he says, I haven't come to judge the world. I've come to save the world. There will be a day that God has appointed where I will judge the world. But you know the law, you executor, but he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Jesus was never saying that adultery didn't matter, but here was a far deeper issue. A group of men using up a woman and pretending to follow God's law and not even acknowledging it, not even aware. And, uh, and God, he's given every person a conscience. 
And it says that starting from the oldest, these men with the stones in their hands ready to throw, filed out. Now, did they file out because as, you're, as you grow older, sometimes your conscience gets more and more sensitive? You know, sometimes I look back in horror at some of the things I've done, some of the things I should have done that I didn't do. But is it simply because the older were the first to see that they couldn't defeat Jesus? That they could come with their best efforts at malicious questions and couldn't defeat him and couldn't beat him. And that was their encounter with Jesus. Will your conscience tell you that it's not really about this woman, it's about you and about your evil heart of, of not obeying the greatest command to love the Lord your God, to love Jesus and to follow him. You point out a splinter in someone else's eye and you fail to see the log in your own eye. It's like the friends of Job when they came to help him and uh, there was this period of silence and, uh, and from then on it only got worse as they said things that were just not right, not tr true. And uh, so the hands of the witnesses, it says in Deuteronomy 17, will be the first to ca ca shall cast the first stone. So when you cast the first stone, you're saying you're without sin. Well, that deserves stoning. So, uh, you know, you've never had a lustful thought ever in your life, Jesus was saying. You've always thought the best of your wife. You've always loved her and, and put her first in everything. You've never done anything selfish. Shall I go on? It, uh, it's convicting. And uh, Jesus, in one sense, Jesus was the only one who had the right to throw the stone. But when he came before Pilate, Pilate said, I can find nothing wrong in this man. He was without sin. And yet, what did he do? Only he was left with the woman in the centre. And when Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Well, neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. How brutal were the scribes and Pharisees. How gentle was Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees were using this woman as a thing to get at Jesus. Jesus treated her as a precious soul, a precious person made in the image of God. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. But isn't Jesus pure and righteous and, and holy? Well, firstly, I believe the woman had come to the point in her life where she had no excuse. She simply looks at Jesus and calls him Lord. But then to become a Christian in a sense is to finally stop all the excuses that I have. God says when you look at creation in Romans 1, you are really without excuse that God is. And so often we have excuses. I know I had plenty of excuses before I became a Christian. And there has to come that point where we have no excuse before him. We simply receive the gift of eternal life, of forgiveness by faith in him. But secondly, there's another verse in Romans where in chapter 3 he says, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God presented Jesus to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. So here was Jesus who could say, neither do I condemn you, because not only was he holy and pure, 
but he would justify those who came to him in faith. He is both just and the justifier. And, and so he can say that. And yet those words, neither do I condemn you, those words cost him his life on the cross. Because up till the point we were under, until we become a Christian, we're under the condemnation of sin and all its consequences. But when Jesus died for us on the cross, he bore the condemnation of God upon sin. And the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Out of the depths I call to you, it says in Psalm 130, listen to my voice, Lord, to my cry for help. With you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. No longer condemned, not because Jesus has gone soft on sin, but because he himself, in his own body, bore our sins on the cross. I can't remember where I read this, but um, someone said, See how he says, first, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go and sin no more, and then I won't condemn you. The Christian life springs out of the fact that we've received the gift of his acceptance, his love, that Jesus no longer condemns us. And that sets us free to follow him. It releases us from all that would bind us. In 2 Corinthians 5, he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and raised him to life. The Pharisees used this woman. Jesus loved this woman and he made salvation and restoration possible. The Pharisees, you know, spent the night scheming and peeking through windows to destroy a life, to get at someone else. Jesus spent the night in prayer on Mount, the Mount of Olives. And to, what I want to say in finishing is that time with Jesus... I trust that this has been an encounter with Jesus. And time with Jesus starts to change us. You know, sometimes I've been praying for my brother for a long time. But God's had to show me, he says to me, you've changed, Harold. And sometimes God has to change us before he can do something in someone else's life. And, and, and so God is saying to us with this encounter with Jesus, see how Jesus didn't rush in like these wicked men, but he looked at her and she looked at him and she came to believe in him. I, Paul, myself, when he writes to the Corinthians, appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Help us. Lord, to encounter you like this and see you for who you really are. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful story and uh, for your great love for each one of us, your care for us. And Lord, we just pray that you'd keep us from quick judgments, from using people for our plans and help us to enter into the very life of Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.